Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11. What do we use to protect ourselves? Is it an object or a belief or a person or a lucky talisman such as a rabbit's foot or special penny? In a dangerous and confusing world, everyone tends to have a defense prepared against the fears that creep into our lives. Whether it be a well-oiled shotgun or a personal security service or a practiced and unfeeling cynicism or an unquestioned ethnic or political allegiance, we all have that protection we don in order to get through the hectic days and harrowing nights. We pile on more and more layers of protection in the hopes that we can win an unwinnable battle against the judgment of death and decay to which our bodies will ultimately always succumb. We are a bit like a 15th century knight on a mighty steed bred for war, our intricate and thick plate armor shining in the sun as we confidently charge toward our enemies, only to be cut down by a peasant with a crude matchlock musket. As those noble knights of lore and legend died on the blood-red fields of Europe, I wonder if they recognize the irony of the whole tragic scene. The very thing these men of war thought would be their greatest protection made them easy targets for an enemy they didn't fully understand. As Christians, and non-Christians for that matter, our greatest danger lies in clinging to protections that provide nothing but a false sense of security against an enemy we don't fully understand. This enemy is not frightened by hollow points or hashtags or political action committees. He was there the first time man raised his fist in anger against his brother. And, the, and he smiled and laughed as the red tide of death washed over God's perfect creation. He smiles at us too when we pick up whatever useless weaponry his culture has taught us to pick up whenever we are afraid. The Anglican apologist C.S. Lewis in his novel Paralandra describes the devil's smile in this way. He writes, the smile was not bitter nor raging nor in an ordinary sense sinister. It was not even mocking. It seemed to me to summon with horrible naivete of welcome to summon me into the world of its own pleasures, as if all men were at one in those pleasures, as if they were the most natural thing in the world and no dispute could have ever occurred upon them. His smile did not defy goodness. It ignored it to the point of annihilation. This creature was wholehearted. The extremity of his evil had passed beyond the struggle into some state which bore a horrible similarity to innocence. It was beyond vice. That is the smile which greets us whenever we, our true enemy sees us reach for the rusty weapons he has placed just within our grasp. Whether one is blowing up police cars to protect, uh, excuse me, to protest brutality, or defending sexual predators to protect family values, whether one is sending checks to Planned Parenthood to promote healthy living, or closing one's eyes to ignore the plight of the poor and the widowed, these impulses should be examined in the bright light of God's word. These weapons, in fact, should be cast aside and replaced with the true protection that can only be granted by the God who first wiped the smile off of Satan's face, the God whose beaming countenance will light the new heaven and the new earth, the God who gives us his armor to stand firm against the assaults of all of our enemies. In today's excerpt from St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians, we see an astonishing call for unity and perseverance in the face of temporal and spiritual persecution. The letter as a whole overflows with 
assurances from the Apostle that the victory over sin and death has been accomplished by Jesus the Messiah, and that our victorious King will protect all those whom the Spirit has made alive and new. In fact, a new society within the fallen world has been created, and that society should serve as an embassy for the new heaven and the new earth that is coming. To paraphrase Anglican theologian John Stott, we are to be a people united in fellowship, diverse in spiritual gifts, pure in living, and harmoniously self-sacrificial in our domestic lives. Unity, diversity, purity, and harmony. This is what a stranger should see when they peer into a Christian church or a Christian home. What makes this witness hard is our personal weakness and the enemy ready to take advantage of it. St. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Notice that St. Paul does not tell us to be strong in ourselves or look to our ethnicity or political ideology or whatever band-aid seems more real for us than the assured hope of the cross and the resurrection. In fact, the word translated as strength here is the same as we find in verse 19 of chapter 1, in which the apostle is, is describing the very strength that raised Christ from the dead. The question becomes, if one has access to the mighty God who reigns over life and death, why would one trust in any other strength? The answer is because we are weak and we are poisoned by an enemy we don't fully understand. As an example of our lack of understanding, a recent survey commissioned by the well-respected Ligonier Ministries found that the majority of American self-identified Christians are logically inconsistent heretics who know very little about the Bible or the faith they profess to follow. I'll put the full results on our church website, but some of the highlights are jarring enough. The survey found that 64% say that God accepts the worship of all religions. 74% say that small sins, whatever that means, do not deserve eternal damnation. Over half of the people surveyed, including 70% of evangelicals, described Jesus Christ as a created being. Sorry, St. John. Other results show a complete breakdown of any kind of objective moral purity. Sleep with whomever you want. Abort your unwanted children at will. A full 60% say there is no hell, and another 60% say we are all going to heaven, a heaven being whatever one wants it to be. The problem with all of these answers is that they directly contradict the witness of the New Testament, a witness these people say they use to guide their lives. When pressed by a pollster, people fall back on what they know and what they know is what the culture has taught them is acceptable to believe. That is a tragedy, and an explanation why so many are confused and lost. We are entering the era of a post-Christian America, and we are brandishing a puppy in a knife fight. The small and painful and embarrassing ignorance shown by our fellow Americans and co-religionists reveals how ill-prepared we are to face the real threat posed by the supernatural forces described by St. Paul. We see that this organized evil attacks us directly and through various proxies because the Church of Christ is the great force for good in the world. Evil exists to oppose us and to oppose the God we represent. Every other conflict in the world is a sideshow to the great conflict between Satan and the Church. Do we actually believe that? Or do we functionally prioritize, 
pretty much every other conflict in our lives above the great struggle in which we are called to stand? Do we lay down the armor of God because we need to really fight and don't want to be encumbered by the weight of what we owe to our Savior and our Redeemer? These questions are quite challenging, but the challenge is really only to our fallen presuppositions and learned behaviors. The challenge melts away as we realize just what the God of the universe is calling us to when he commands us to don the armor of God. St. Paul continues, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. We are in the evil day because every day will be evil until our Savior returns. And this weaponry is all that stands between us and the forces of darkness. This armor is the same as that worn by God himself in chapter 59 of Isaiah, but now is entrusted to us to wear as we do battle in the name of the living God. We battle for the souls of our neighbors by standing firm in the power that raised a glorified Christ from his tomb. We wear that power. We are surrounded by that power. We are protected by that power. Nothing can truly hurt us because any pain inflicted by this world is nothing but a temporary wound. That will be like a treasured medal in the eternity which awaits Christ's faithful servant soldiers. The belt of truth is a figurative symbol for the truth of the gospel and the life of integrity that springs from knowing that truth. As Jesus tells us, if you abide in my word, you truly are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8, 31-32. The truth of the gospel frees us from the chains of sin and death, from self-righteousness and self-deception, from fear and self-loathing. By living in the truth we can only find in the word of God, we are free to live lives of integrity and sincerity, where we no longer fear to tell the truth because what consequences may follow do not scare us. For no consequences can harm us because there is nothing the world can do to shake our eternal destiny. What freedom that truth brings. What light it shines in the dark recesses of our society, in the dark corners of our own souls. Next is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate here being the most important piece of armor because it protects the vital organs from harm. Here, St. Paul is speaking of both the righteousness of God, freely given to all those who truly believe in Christ Jesus, as well as the holy life which is lived in gratitude for this justifying act. All true Christians are clothed in the righteousness of Christ through the great exchange of our sin-stained rags for this shining protection against all the slanders and deceits of the devil. As St. Paul describes it, For our sake the Father made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 It is in our justification, daily meditated upon, that we see our changed status as citizens of the kingdom of God. We are protected from any other allegiance that might draw us away from our true king, because God has declared us as one of his own. We are his, and no one can take that away from us. The war boots come next, boots that represent the peace which flows from the gospel, a peace that readies us to fight evil. I cannot hear this verse without thinking of Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news 
who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. St. Paul sees this prophecy coming true in his own time and reverberating through all the ages to come. Christ has ascended into heaven to take his throne in the nerve center of all reality. Our Lord has reigned ever since, and all Christians should find peace in that victory. He has already won. Peace in the kingdom is breaking through our small and violent world. All of the covenantal promises of God are coming true in that victory, and blessedly, we have been chosen to be part of that reality. We are the people who proclaim the true peace that comes from a world working in the way it was designed to work. A world where people and justice are not just excuses to hurt others. Unfortunately, as much as we may wish it, real peace on earth will never come as long as humanity lives in rebellion against its creator, as long as we fail to recognize why we are here. Christians should be ever ready to share the peace we know in Jesus Christ, a peace we may sometimes forget but can never undo, a peace that passeth all understanding because it comes from God and not from our naive and hypocritical dreams of utopia. The Roman shield envisioned by St. Paul was a large wooden protector about the same dimensions as a front door and its shape and materials were specially designed to be effective against flaming arrows. This shield represents the faith or trust a Christian must have against the fiery temptations which constantly attack us. For most people do not abandon the faith because they find it unreasonable. There are plenty of things we all believe in that we can't exactly explain. More and more people are trusting their very lives to increasingly complex cellular phones that might as well work by magic given our inability to explain their operations. Or what about the complex algorithms that are making more and more of the decisions in our world? These complex mathematical processes that even their designers can't fully explain decide everything from how much your house is worth to what stocks your mutual fund should buy and sell. We have blind faith in all of these things every day. We trust they will work, and we live our lives standing on that faith. No, most people do not abandon the faith because they find it unreasonable. They abandon the faith because they like sinning. They put their shield down and allow the fiery darts of the evil one to burn them alive. Sadly, as we sin more and more, we need greater and greater stimulants to get the same kind of addictive feeling sin provides. The burn goes deeper and deeper until we become an exposed nerve, living for nothing for the next opportunity for stimulus. To be fair, that is the right way to live if we have no hope. If all we have is the next bit of pleasurable impulse, and then we eventually die and cease to exist, then there really is no reason to care. As the nation moves to a post-Christian status, we see this dystopia developing. As the country becomes more atheistic, we're not getting Star Trek, we're getting an idiocracy. It is in the faithful trust in the resurrection and all the life-changing ramifications true faith in that event brings which protects us from burning up from the inside out. We're either living for the new heaven and new earth, or we're not. The helmet of salvation is a sign of our present experience in this life and our future hope in the next. The theologian Thomas Torrance is reported to have always answered the question, when were you saved with a curt 2,000 years ago on the cross of Jesus Christ? Our war helmet is a symbol of that great act and the protection it provides to us both now and before the great judgment we all will face at the end of this world and the beginning of the next. Our salvation is not something we earn, but an ever-present reality for all those who follow the ever-conquering King. 
the King who died for us and will stand at our side in the great trial to come. Our helmet of salvation protects us in that truth. Which brings us to our final item, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is that Word of God described in the book of Hebrews. He writes, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and of discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. The Holy Scriptures, breathed by God, can be quite painful. In the same way a surgeon's knife can cause pain as it cuts through a cancerous mass. Anyone who reads the Bible and does not find a challenge to his life is simply not reading enough. It is probably for this reason that so many American Christians just don't read their Bibles anymore. But as we strap on the various parts of the armor of God, we can finally recognize that this cleansing pain is not bad. We can finally recognize that the pain we feel as the Holy Spirit purges our hearts is itself a part of our war against sin, the flesh, and the devil. We need not be afraid of pain or death because we are arrayed in the armor of the living God. Finally, as we listen to these beautiful words dictated by St. Paul, these beautiful words of encouragement to all present and future Christians, we have to remember he wrote these sitting in a jail cell, chained to a Roman soldier, wearing the armor of what conventional wisdom said would be an eternal empire. Any outside observer would have looked at these two men, one a living example of earthly might, and the other a broken and imprisoned example of a living sacrifice, and they would have seen the epitome of earthly success and failure. Our eyes would have seen one man proudly armored and another almost naked. But our eyes would have been deceived, as they so often are. For it was St. Paul who stood ready to face the inevitable challenge of death, and not the proud soldier wearing his useless costume. In reality, in the spiritual reality in which all things are truly governed, the old saint was wearing an armor that never rusts as he prepared for a life that never ends. Let us don that armor, and let us never again be afraid. In the name of the Father.